And just like that, it's over. The Patriots have an offensive coordinator. His name is Alex Van Pelt. He is 53 years old. He's been in the NFL 28 years when you include a stint uh, as a Bills backup quarterback. But what you really care about is that he was the Browns offensive coordinator for the last four years. Quarterbacks coach before that. Offensive coordinator briefly in Buffalo in 2009. And now charged with remaking the Patriots offense for Gerard Mayo. Mike Giardi is coming on to unload intel on Alex Van Pelt. What he saw at the Senior Bowl this week. The Patriots process that led them to Van Pelt. But before we get to that, I wanted to hit on a couple of things um, for you. For things I've said previously. And my reporting on Nick Cayley being a finalist on Wednesday. Um, because of course on Thursday, timing being everything, doesn't sound so great. But I'll get to that in a second. First of all. I want to say thank you to everyone who answered the call uh, for me as far as ratings and reviews go for this podcast. You came out in droves. Most of the feedback was terrific, which we love to hear. But as I said then, have said always, and will say now, we take the good with the bad. The point is to get better. It's to grow. It's to reach you, teach you, entertain and educate as best as you want. Uh, all of that to be done. And when you give us feedback... That helps me do that. So thank you very much for those who gave us a rating on Spotify or Apple. If you have not, always welcome. Uh, and the, review, the reviews in particular help us grow. The second thing is, a couple of weeks ago, in an address about my colleague Doug Hyde and how you could help him as he continues to deal with the loss of his two-year-old daughter, Hallie, to leukemia, I asked you to you know, make a mark on the calendar, set an alarm, write yourself a note, um, to let Doug know around this time, a week after Hallie's wake, what he's meant to you. And Doug has been on the beat since 2014. He is as good as any beat reporter we have in New England. I would argue that goes across sports. I've spoken about how I feel about Doug personally, professionally, many times. I'll leave it there. But I will ask you again to just email him. Send him a note because it will help him get through this time when family's left, friends have gone home, the services are over, everyday life returns, is you're left with your sorrow and sadness and you feel alone. Let's let Doug know he's not alone. Write him a note because kind messages are what he told me will help him get through this. What well, obviously is a long uh, grieving process ahead. So please email him D-K-Y-E-D for Doug Kyde, D-K-Y-E-D at bostonherald.com. Every message counts. The third thing, uh, Nick Kelly reported on Wednesday night, a finalist. He was as close to this job as any candidate got. And that's not just because he had a second interview. The Patriots are higher on him than Luke Getze who's the ex-Bears offensive coordinator who came in for a second in-person interview uh, on Tuesday. Kaylee flew in from Los Angeles. He got dinner with the team, interviewed fully on Monday, and then something happened. And you'll hear in my conversation with Mike Giardi that I say, I haven't nailed down that he declined the job or asked for too much or wasn't given power that he wanted. As soon as I know, you will hear it on this podcast or find it on my Twitter feed. But I understand the optics of Wait, this guy just said Kaylee was a finalist, and then 24 hours later, they're hiring someone that no one had any kind of reporting on, aside from Alex Van Pelt might make sense. He's been around. He's coached quarterbacks. And so, again, Kaylee was as close as anyone came. I've heard he was offered. I have not nailed that down and reported it, which is why I did not report it in that story on Wednesday or on TV on Wednesday night. If I do, you will hear from me. In the meantime, please enjoy this conversation with Mike Giardi from the Boston Sports Journal. He's the best. I'm going to tell him that, and I mean it. And uh, that goes for you, too, at home. We appreciate everyone listening. And finally, the search is over. We can move on to a new topic, draft, for agency, everything, though you'll get more background on Van Pelt uh, next week. And, uh, again, just, just appreciate you at home. All right, moving on. Pat's interference. A happy Super Bowl to all who celebrate from FanDuel, America's number one sports book. If you're like me, Super Bowl Sunday is all about scoring the best seat on the couch or the lazy boy. And grabbing your favorite football snacks and placing some super bets. The Super Bowl 49ers Chiefs, look, we all saw it four years ago. It is very different this time around. I think there is value to be found, whether you like prop bets or the money line or the spread. So go to FanDuel, where you have so many ways to end the season with a W, even if the Patriots didn't, or maybe two or three, depending on how many bets you want to place. And not only can you bet on who will win Super Bowl 58, but FanDuel also has bets for which players will score a touchdown, how many points will be scored, and so much more. Don't forget the national anthem. And new customers, if you have not joined FanDuel yet, if you join today, you will get $200, 200 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. So join FanDuel and visit FanDuel at FanDuel.com Boston to sign up. 
That's FanDuel.com slash Boston. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sportsbook partner of the NFL. All right, so the Patriots search needed 12 candidates. It needed 11 days. My search needed one text, then another text, maybe a follow-up gift, but there was only one person I had in mind at the end of Senior Bowl week, not knowing where the offensive coordinator search was going to go, and that was Mike Giardi, who uh, thankfully is soft enough to always relent to my request and come back on the podcast, our most popular guest in Pat's Interference. Mike, happy Friday. Happy Friday to you as well, Andrew. I I, I don't know if you can tell this from the, from the camera shot, but... Where I was in Mobile at the Senior Bowl, the sun was coming down off the metallic bleachers and coming up this way. So I'm literally, I'm two-faced. I'm Harvey Dent. It's like I am burned from this side over. This side is as white as your head. Thank you for that. Uh, because I, I, was, I was not going to mention, that was your favorite tweet of mine during the whole week at the Senior Bowl, if I'm being honest, because the quarterback's <laughs> not playing well did not encourage me. The receivers being touch and go was like, okay. Uh, I didn't hear a lot of offensive tackle talk. There's a lot to watch down there in Mobile. And we will get to everything that you saw because uh, you're also, unbeknownst to this, I played a game with myself called Text Mike the Word Scuttlebutt as much as I could before you'd say, <laughs> can you find another word to say for rumors or nuggets or whispers? And you were just fine, just inundated ah. With scuttlebutt. So anyway, that's that's what we were originally going to talk about. Alex Van Pelt blows up all of those plans Wednesday into Thursday when he interviews uh, roughly 24-hour process. He's the guy, 12th candidate. I want to zoom out, though, to start because, like I said at the top, 12 candidates, 11 days. Yes, this happened Wednesday into Thursday when he was hired. But the way they got to Alex Van Pelt was a winding road that I think deserves to retrace because that is the proper context for what had been the most important decision of the offseason today. Fair? Oh, 100%. Uh, And it was a meandering kept coming up as this sort of dragged on and sort of some of the candidates that came in and out. And uh, I'm happy, Andrew, that they did talk to as many people as they did because, as we well know, with a head coaching search, there was no head coaching search for the first time in 24 years. You could have opened it up to the world and instead – you had already decided a year ago that Gerard Mayo was going to be the coach and you didn't interview anyone, which I thought was uh, criminal <laughs> to a certain degree. At least in this case with the OCs, you had a lot of different people with different backgrounds come into your room. And if Gerard Mayo is as smart as I believe he is, and Elliot Wolf is as smart as I believe he is, they were taking notes. They were putting those guys on the board like you would do with a player. You're trying to pick up as much information as possible as they look to shape this thing going forward. So that part of it was good. But, boy, it it took a long time to get here, and I think we're all sort of surprised that it ended on Alex Van Pelt. Definitely a surprise. All right, let's start, though, in the obvious place, which was Nick Cayley, who was the Mm -hmm. first person to interview. Again, 12-day search, 12 candidates, five dropped out to take other jobs or stay with their teams in this process, which, when you shoot high, is going to happen in whatever business that you're running. So I don't hold that in and of itself, within a vacuum against the Patriots. You know, Dan Pitcher gets promotion in Cincinnati, mazel tov. But Kaylee's first interview occurs on Monday, January 22nd. It was a virtual interview. Zach Robinson follows, then Shane Waldron, and Dan Pitcher. Within days, everyone from that group, as I mentioned, uh, takes a different job or stays put. So the Pats expand. They go to Texans quarterback coach Gerard Johnson. Couple 49ers assistants. Lions pass game coordinator uh, Tanner Engstrand, who became this quiet, like, Pat's Twitter favorite. Please, 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 Dan, which I don't blame right. folks. Again, he seems like a rising star. Maybe Ben Johnson's successor, but Ben Johnson is like putting roots upon roots down in Detroit. Um, Scott Turner comes up, Bears ex, uh, ex-Bears offensive coordinator Luke Getze, and then Nick Cayley. And Cayley and Getze come back for second interviews in New England, this time in person. So you go from the hour-long Zooms, which we'll talk about in a second because you and I both heard feedback about the coaches who interviewed and their process with that. Kaylee then flies back to L.A. after his interview Monday. Getty comes in Tuesday and then goes to New Orleans to interview for the Saints job. And he's not Getty, as far as I heard, very high on the Saints list, but I, I don't cover the Saints. Talk about scuttlebutt. <laughs> on Wednesday, I report that Nick Kaylee was a finalist, the first finalist for the Patriots job. As they say, life is all about timing. Timing is everything. That same day, they interview Alex Van Pelt. He gets the job a day later. And... This is what I suspect, because this happens right around the time that Van Pelt gets hired and interviewed. Kaylee 
I could not nail down a report. I do not know that he rejected an offer or was offered the job and asked for too much. But when you hear certain things as I have, or if you've heard nothing and you just want to read the tea leaves of a guy who was the first interview, has connections here, gets a second interview, does not get the job, and he was a finalist 100%, and then you move quickly on to someone else who was the 12th out of 12 candidates, I suspect Kaylee turned the job down. Ultimately, it doesn't matter. Alex Van Pelt is here. Thus ends the search. What do you make of that winding road? Yeah, I I think it's hard not to, um, and talking to certain people, get the sense that Kaylee was the front runner. And then as to what happened between him leaving and ending up on Alex, the Patriots ending up on Alex Van Pelt is, as you said, there's still haven't quite been able to nail that down. Um, If you've noticed, there's a, there's a great deal of comfort involved in some of the search here. And so when Nick came back, I'm like, Gerard knows him. He knows what he's about. He knows the work ethic that the kid brings to the table. Kid, he's 40 now, uh, brings to the table. Um, You're not that old, Mike. Had... Give yourself some credit. <laughs> <laughs> I know. He obviously had the, um, you know, the year abroad, if you will, with Sean McVay. So, you're not getting the full McVay. Like I, there's, you're not picking up that language in a, in a full year and the, and the whole concept of it, the concepts behind it, but you are getting at least some of that that you're able to dip into. And then of course you have the, you know, his formative years were, were under Josh McDaniels. And, and then unfortunately for him, one year under Matt Patricia and Joe judge. Um, I thought it was curious in the sense that there was to me, what's he know best and in times when you when you're struggling, what do you fall back on? You fall back on the things you know best. So to think that he was going to transform this offense from what it's been and from the system that they've been in forever, the Perkins Earhart system, into this newfangled thing or a combination of, I thought was going to be a bit of a stretch. But I, I, I mean, I can't say enough good things about Nick. And just this isn't just my own personal relationship with him. It's not like we're friends or anything, but just covering him. Um, talking to other people around the league about him like he's been someone that's been sort of in that cauldron of like he's going to be an OC he's going to be a head coach one day um and you'd think you'd want some bright guys like that on your staff but Bill made the decision to go with his his cronies and um Nick wisely got out and I think the the interesting thing for me with Nick is I know Nick's happy in Los Angeles yes I know his I know his family is happy in Los Angeles so we like to put these things in a vacuum and just say, like, the coaching job. Well, if you look at Nick's career prior to getting to New England and being in New England from 2015 to 2022, he was everywhere. He was Ohio and, he, like you know, like it was one year to the next job, to the next state, to, like, constant. And I, he's got a young family. I'm sure it was, ni- it's, it was nice for a little bit in New England to be able to put roots down. And maybe he feels the same way about Los Angeles. Like, why would I leave a situation that's way better than the one that I would be um, stepping into in New England, even if I would be getting a promotion and maybe one more year under McVay? Who knows? Maybe he gets an elevation there. Or, again, just as it has happened with the Shanahan McVay guys, another year in the system, more shine on you. And then the next thing you know, maybe you're a head coach. Maybe you just bypass the whole damn thing and you end up coaching your own team. So uh, I think all that's in play. Standing next to Sean McVay is the NFL's magic fairy dust, right? The longer you stand (laughs) there, the more you accumulate like dandruff on your shoulders and you just continue to shine, even in seasons when they have a bottom 10 offense like they did a year ago. And then to Sean's credit, bring in outside coaches, Nick Cayley, Ryan Wendell to evolve his offense. Like that is not a static system. There are certain things, the 11 personnel jet motion um, that they're going to keep in place. Like that's the structure of the offense, but he evolved it because teams, you know, years before that started to copy what the Patriots did in the Super Bowl, leads to a down year in 2019. And so anyway, they incorporate elements from good coaches. Uh, Sean is an excellent head coach, but a lot of what you just said there, I think is going to go overlooked by people who are obviously eager to hear us talk about this, but the family component is absolutely true. And it's not only Nick's background as someone who, you know, as you said, moved around Ohio, Illinois, Florida, all across college and Foxborough, Massachusetts. But it's the family component being like, okay, we have security here. Our toes are in the sand 
in the beaches of Los Angeles. You work for a great, friendly, caring boss. If you go back and take this job and flounder in three years, you are a longtime Patriots assistant who couldn't succeed without Bill Belichick, which means get in line, buddy. You're just like everybody else. <laughs> and so that's job security. Sure, you get a little bit more money with the promotion. But Nick wants to be an offensive coordinator. He's only 41. He wants to be a head coach. I've heard a lot of the same things um, as you have. Incredibly smart, egoless, cares about the the process and his players. And if someone put it to me, yeah, I got screwed over by Bill at the end, unofficially in 2022 and officially in 2023. So we'll leave that there. Now, again, saying all those things about Nick, it is also very possible that in hiring Alex Van Pelt, 12th candidate of 12, the Patriots made the right decision. Nick has never coached quarterbacks before. Yes, he's been in New England, but this was a search dedicated to guys except for him who had never been in New England. Like, I don't know, aside from coaching an away game in Foxborough, if they'd ever been here before. Right. Alex Van Pelt has coached quarterbacks. He's been a coordinator. He's done all of that. So we recap the search. What was good about the process? Because I, I, there's a lot of negativity that's swirling, and we'll get to some of that. But what did you at least like about this process? I think I said at the beginning about the idea that you talk to a bunch of different people and you you know you experience from a bunch of different organizations, um, different levels of organization you know player uh, coaches from different levels of organizations. And I think that's important because I think when you shut off your head coaching search, you, you lose the idea uh, the the ability to sort of mine ideas from other people or hear ideas and uh, the counter to run counter to yours. And to be able to do that with the offensive coordinator is a, is a positive. Like everybody has, you know, as they saw a lot of different West Coast McVay Shanahan guys, right? Um, but there's different viewpoints on that. So did they like one more than the other? Did they think after talking to so-and-so like, okay, well, we might not hire him, but we may take some of that and bring it to whoever it is that we're going to hire as the offensive coordinator and say like, Let's see if we can we can work this in a little bit. So I, I think that was good to be able to mine ideas because it's cliche, it's a copycat league, right? But like you, the, the to be able to pick people's brains and get ideas that maybe you haven't used here. I mean, obviously we're they're 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 clearly going with a different direction than the one they've been in for the last thirty some odd years offensively. So like I, I'm open to different kind of ideas to make that work, and maybe it's going to take a little bit of trial and error to find out what works with the personnel you have, which again, like, we don't know who the quarterback is. <laughs> we don't know who your tackles are. Like we don't know, we don't know who your tight ends are. Pretty much. We don't know anything about the <laughs> offense because pretty much there's very few guys that are on the offense currently under contract that you'd say like, okay, yeah, I feel good with that. Like David Andrews. I feel good about David Andrews. Ramondre Stevenson. Pop Douglas. Eh, okay. That's good. There we are. Three names. So I, I like that part of it. Um, and you mentioned, like, is it possible that they they landed on the right person after all? It's interesting to me because we sit there and look like I do love the quarterback idea. And I think that was my one knock against Kaylee was that he'd never coached quarterbacks. And so if you were going to go with Nick, then you needed to bring someone in with a ton of experience coaching quarterbacks because that room's going to look different. It's probably going to have a, a rookie, whether he's the third pick or the 35th pick. Um, it, you know, there's going to be fresh blood there. And there's probably going to be a, a veteran that's not one of the two veterans that, well, we'll call them veterans. They, they played some games in the league that, that was in your room this past year. So you're going to have someone that's going to be able to need to translate all that stuff and going to be able to shepherd along a young kid and make sure that he doesn't get broken like the, the last guy did that you drafted in the first round. So that part of it's good. But then Alex hasn't really called plays. 2009 was the, was his really his only season calling plays in Buffalo and got blown out after one year. I mean, that, that staff was terrible. Uh, I mean, that, that team was terrible. Perry Fuels, the, the head coach. Well, let's stay with the first though for a quick second because yeah. I, I think like well, the, the result is the result now, right? It's Alex Van Pelt. Mm -hmm. He's the guy. All the things you're saying are really important. But the way the Patriots got here – is also important because they're about to make a series of other very important decisions with the draft at number three overall, free agency. And if some of the things that we're describing, money, uh, you know, how attractive the Patriots are as a destination, not just for coaches, but for players and perhaps draft picks, especially quarterbacks at the top, it might have some leverage to go, I'm not going there. This could be something they either learn from and, hey, we need to make a better sales pitch. So do you, 
was this good process overall? Just these 12 days, these candidates, what we know about how they conducted the search. Without being able to have sat in the room and listened to the, the Q&A, the conversations back and forth, but only being able to glean from different people about those conversations in the aftermath. I don't, I don't know that the Patriots came across as super impressive, at least in some of these, uh, some of these interviews and whether that's because they were fishing for ideas, if that's because they weren't totally sure exactly what direction they wanted to go moving forward offensively, what they wanted to embrace fully, what they want their identity to be. Um, Again, sort of you hear different things from different people. So that, that can, that concerned me because I think there were a lot of people that uh, as you mentioned, either re-upped with their old team or found different jobs that came away from it thinking like, "It's, it's not a lot there or there's a lot of questions that I would have. And I don't know that you want to go into this. I think you want to have a clear vision for what their vision is. So you know how you have to operate. And I think that some people in the process came away with like, I don't know if I know that they know what they're doing. If get all those words together. that And that's tough. And the feedback I heard was, it was solid. It was fine as far as the interviews, which included Gerard, you know, Elliot Wolf and Matt Groh helped him along with this process looking for coordinators mm-hmm. of no Elliot Wolf overlap for an extensive period of time with Alex Van Pelt in Green Bay, where Van Pelt was an assistant for five seasons. And then again in Cleveland in 2020, which was Wolf's last stop outside of New England before coming to their front office. And so I look at the process and go, it, it could have been better, obviously. Like this, this was not perfect. Whether if we include Kaylee, six candidates out of the 12 taking other jobs as you're trying to pitch all of them on your job. But I like that, as you said, it was expansive. I like that you started with hour long Zooms, that this is, you know, very little opportunity cost to doing what we're doing now, because you and I both can go on with our days and do a lot of other things and learn more. Mm -hmm. But I think the point that you make about not knowing exactly what you want at the start, and I was wrong last week, full stop, about saying it was too early to say they want McVay or Shanahan guys. Van Pelt's more of a traditional West Coast offense, and we'll get into more of those specifics in later episodes. But I think when you start with Kaylee, Robinson, Waldron, uh, even Pitcher, like very clearly McVay guys, same thing with Gerard Johnson and the 49ers, Shanahan. Like the longer the search went on, the further you got away from a central commonality, something binding all of these candidates together. And the fact that you not only landed on someone who was – far away from the search, not even included as far as we knew until Wednesday, but also not included within really those systems, even though he worked under Stefanski, who learned under Gary Kubiak, who of course is a longtime Mike Shanahan assistant. That tells me that what you're hearing and what I've heard is absolutely right. They didn't know exactly what they wanted at the start. And when you don't get your first ideal answer, whether it was Zach Robinson or not, or Nick Cayley or not, and then you go to plan B and C, you're really scrambling more than someone who says, I want these three guys and it's okay if I get the third. Yeah. And I don't like, look at it, you. I've talked to people about Alex. You've talked to people about Alex. People think very highly of Alex, but it, it almost gives you that sort of like, eh, eh. feels like they settled or feels like it's sort of like a, it's a meh hire. You know what I mean? You're just like, you're not like, Oh, I hate it. You're not like I love it, and even if people on the outside looking in, like Zach Robinson, like, oh, you got to go get Zach, and you're like, you don't know, what do you know about Zach? I, you know, like other than the fact that he was a long he had a lot of fairy dust on him, Mike. That, that, exactly. That's exactly. You, uh, by the way, just as a quick aside, the two worst quarterbacks I've ever seen in Patriots training camp, oh, and no. mind you, 25 years of covering them, Tim Tebow, Tim Tebow, who ran more than any quarterback in seven-on-sevens I'd ever seen until Mac Jones two years ago in the Patricia uh, (laughs) Judge offense and Zach Robinson. And I was just like, you know, going back and like doing some stuff on Zach as we were going through the process and and getting ready for certain things. I'm like, I forgot that he hung around the league for four years. Now, Now, granted, he didn't play, but he was around the league in different practice squads for four years. And I was like, 
I don't, that's pretty remarkable that he stayed around the league for four years because he truly was the, the worst. Worst than Tebow. Yeah. Well, I mean, Tebow was what Tebow was. Like, you know, Tebow was a fullback playing quarterback. Like, I didn't have any expectations when Tebow came in that Tebow was going to blow me away with how he threw the football. But Zach, coming out of college, like, oh, you'd heard some good things. And he gets there, you're like, no, that is not it, folks. That is not it. So, anyway, just a random aside. Right. A drive-by on Zach Robinson, who did nothing to deserve it, but just an observation from 2010 that he was <laughs> not a good quarterback. Uh, or the worst ever in 25 years of major <laughs> training camps. You heard it here first from Mike Giardi. Uh, Please forward all hate mail to at Mike Giardi on Twitter. Um, all right, let's get to Alex Van Pelt, because you're right. I did text someone who worked very recently with Van Pelt, who had glowing things to say. And this matters, because this is someone I've relied on for a while uh, to help me you know, get connected more in the league, speak with other people, familiar with the Patriots. Like This is a good person that I go to. And their quote was, great dude, culture changer good coach, West Coast, meaning offensive background, mostly, but has other influences. From Phil Perry, phenomenal culture guy. He's as loyal and team-oriented and as easy to get along with as anyone in the NFL. There is zero ego there, none. So before I list off his resume, and we get into the cold hard facts of every story that you would have read about Alex Van Pelt in the last 12 hours, what can you add to that from folks just around the league about him? I would say that the interesting thing to me was what I didn't hear. And it's back to the play calling thing that mm -hmm. that's we're talking about all these different things, which is important. You're going to, like I said, you're going to have a new room, quarterback room. You might have an entirely new room, but you're, you're definitely going to have some new bodies in there. If maybe one of these guys that's on the current roster sticks around and you're going to have a young player in there. You're going to want him to be able to uh, have a good bond with Van Pelt. And it's clear that in his time with quarterbacks that they love him. Um, have a lot of respect for how he approaches them. He can be tough when he has to be. But by and large, it's he's, you know, he's going to put his arm around these guys, especially the ones that need it. I think he's not someone who coaches. I think he's a good coach in that he coaches to the what this person needs. I'm going to give it to him, you know. It's a, and not everybody can be coached the same way, and I think that's important. But again, it's the it's the part about the play calling. You're turning over this this offense to him. In theory, he's designing the whole thing and driving the whole thing, and it's not something that anybody's really let him do since 2009. I mean, he yes, did he help? Stefanski, did he call a couple games when Stefanski had COVID? Did he call some games in preseason? Sure, but that's not that's not the same thing. It's not the ebb and flow of a 17 game season and postseason and teams reacting to you. And how do you react on game day? How do you react to the adjustments that they made? That was Kevin Stefanski doing most of that. So he's, he's experienced in the league, but he's still an inexperienced play caller. And to think that he's going to come in and it's just going to work smoothly from jump, I think is probably foolish. I think it's, there are going to be some bumps like there would have been if you'd hired, 40 year old Nick Kelly or 30 something year old Zach Robinson like that. I just think that you can't don't confuse the experience of being an NFL coach with the experience of being a play caller. Okay. So here is the skinny on Alex Van Pelt. 19 seasons as an NFL assistant was a backup quarterback with the bills from 95 to 2003. Don't look up the stats. They're, they're hideous. I don't think he's proud of them, <laughs> but look, he stayed in the league eight years uh, or nine years, excuse me, and before that was drafted in 1993 by the Steelers, something that virtually no one else, uh, or very few people can say. So 28 years in the league overall. He was a Browns offensive coordinator from 2020 to 2023. Before that, two years as the Bengals quarterbacks coach in 2018 and 2019. Packers quarterbacks coach, basically from 2014 to 17, also added a year coaching receivers, and before that was their running backs coach from 2012 to 13. A uh, quick stint with the Bucks under Raheem Morris. People forget Tampa Bay head coach Raheem Morris was more than yes. a decade ago. Josh Freeman, folks, uh, good for a yes. the grid if anyone is still playing with me nowadays. And before <laughs> that was uh, the Bills offensive coordinator in 2009, also their quarterbacks coach in 08. And, you know, came up with the Bills because he went to NFL Europe for a year after finished playing and then came back and they were like, okay, we'll take you as a volunteer and then a quality control guy. And then he goes on to the, the run that I just mentioned. And so... Yes, I, I'm I'm with you. None of those offenses, whether he was a part of them as a quarterback's coach or running back's coach, aside from those Packer offenses, which are the most traditional West Coast system, like static, isolation routes, timing, rhythm under Mike McCarthy, 
that none of that jumps off the page. Okay. What you should take, you should be encouraged by is that Alex Van Pelt has learned under Mike McCarthy. Sorry to any Cowboys fans listening to this. I know you just cringe. <laughs> We're going to move on anyway. Then Zach Taylor, who has bounced around the league, but had his best stint under Sean McVay and the Rams and runs a McVay like offense. Again, 11 personnel, jet motion, zone blocking, and then goes to the Browns where Kevin Stefanski starts running a Shanahan system. Again, zone blocking. You know, he leans a little bit more into the two tight ends. And then the last couple of years is running a lot of man blocked run schemes, which you'll most easily identify with a pulling guard. They don't always have a pulling guard or tackle or center but are different from the we're all going in one direction outside zone schemes or inside zone schemes. So he's going to have a lot to draw from. He connects well with people. Obviously, he's been around that experience. Coaching quarterbacks, being a coordinator is a plus. But I'm with you. This is what I say. When people say someone else is nice, okay, or you've been around, that means that you've got nothing else to say about them. (laughs) Oh, my sister's new boyfriend is nice. He probably pays his bills. I, he, he brushes his teeth like the guy showers. And Flosses, again, yep. I want to drive home the quotes. Great dude, culture changer, good coach, West Coast mostly, but has other influences. That's a quote from someone I trust within the league. And, you know, if you knew him, would trust him as well. So let's start there. Um, what do they need to fill in around him? Because this is the next part. Even if he's a quarterback's coach, like what are his next steps? I mean, obviously the offensive line coach, which as – there's been multiple reports about them zeroing in on uh, Dickerson, who was he actually comes from the Patriots. He was in team ops, I think back in like 2004 or something like that was most recently with Seattle and, you know, Seattle just turned over their staff. So he's without a job, but it done a nice job developing some of the younger players. You know, they had a pretty good draft two years ago with some offensive linemen um, tackles in particular, which uh, I don't know if you noticed, you need some there in new England. Um, that's an important one, but like, <clears throat> and I assume, I'm assuming it's still early, but I'm assuming that that came as part of Alex's recommendation. But again, I want to dig deeper into that because I'm concerned about that whole thing because I don't, we just lived it. He gave Bill O'Brien one coach, Will Long. Everybody else was already on the staff. You inherit them, or in Adrian Clem's sense, they, they, you know, I was a classic Bill, right? I drafted him. He was my first draft pick, and like, oh, I know him, and I'm going to bring him back. Okay, great. Um, I, he better, Alex better have more sw- swing, sway on the offensive side and who's getting hired and who's getting fired because they spent a lot of hours together. And again, I think based on his lack of, play calling experience he's going to need to lean on some people and have people he trusts and i don't know that inheriting a staff that wasn't his that isn't loyal to him um is the best thing to do i think we've lived that the last few years and i think it it's proven that it doesn't work so i i don't i don't have an answer on that yet but i that to me is important that whatever the other hires that you're going to fill in that staff on Alex Van Pelt should have his hand in all of it. And we'll see because that word collaboration keeps coming up. It's been the, you know, it's, it's become the buzzword in the NFL, which to me is just like uh, general managers saying, I want to have more control over my coaching staff. So let's talk this collaboration thing. But we heard it a lot in new England and I don't know that I love the, uh, the word I'm starting to, it's starting <laughs> to become a, it's start, it's starting to become a bad word to me. Um, so we well, can't be the C I'm word. Just, we already have one of those. <laughs> yes. Well, it's the new one. It's a new one. So let's, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm curious about it, Andrew. Cause I think that that's code for something that I don't think necessarily is going to work. Um, and I think it's been proven to not always work. So at some point, somebody has to be the one that makes the decisions, whether that's in the front office or whether that's on the coaching staff and uh, I don't think that Gerard Mayo should be forcing a wide receiver coach, running back coach, assistant offensive line coach on his new offensive coordinator who's entrusting to enact an, an entirely new system in here. I don't, I don't think that's a good idea. All right. I am with you on the front office. I think, well, look, 
I think there should be a single leader, and that's different from having a collaborative process, which the Patriots <laughs> ramped up in 2021 after Nick Casario left. Their drafts clearly had started to go downhill. Kraft says, hey, Bill, you, you got to listen to whoever's next. Who's this new guy? Dave Ziegler? Okay, like he gets some more input. Matt Groh gets some more input. Cameron Williams, you know, Elliot Wolf, who just came aboard. That was part of the collaboration yep. there. I'm going to give Mayo the benefit of the doubt, though, on the coaching staff as far as the collaboration because I've spent a lot of time, a lot of other folks have spent a ton of time knocking the Patriots for their lack of diversity of thought. And this is not, again, people who necessarily have different backgrounds but are going to bring new ideas so that ultimately when you bring all of these different uh, schemes or plays or techniques or drills, you'll land on the optimal one as opposed to everyone coming from the same system learning from the same head coach, and then deferring to the same head coach who just has complete power over everything and doesn't have to do anything he wants to do. That, I think, getting rid of that approach is better. But this coaching staff is another, you know, I talk about the things that came up in the offensive coordinator search, how appealing is are the Patriots as an organization to join? Uh, what is their process as far as Mayo versus Wolf versus Matt Groh, you know, interviewing, making these decisions? The offensive line coach is another critical hire, the most important assistant job on any staff who's not a coordinator. They're the highest paid. They have the largest position group. All of their guys set the table for every single run and pass. And Dickerson has never worked on a staff with Van Pelt before. So now I'll say he spent three years in Seattle under Shane Waldron before that nine, which takes you to 2012 with the Rams, bounced around the Jets, Patriots who gave him his first NFL job. I have to think that's Van Pelt though, right? Like. Or where else would that be coming from? Yeah, that's why. And that's to my point, like that's that that to me is my hope because that's an that's a critical relationship. Um, and look, we were spoiled here for a million years with Dante. But like Dante and Josh, Dante and Bill, like Bill O'Brien, when his first tenure as offensive co coordinator here in, in the whatever 2009 ish area, like that relationship was critical, you know, like. Here's what I want to do. Okay, Dante, now go draw it up how we're going to block it. Like, I'm going to, I've got this part of it. You got to handle this part of it. And if you don't handle this part of it, then what we're doing out here is not going to matter. Uh, uh, hello, we've seen that the last few years. Like, that's critical. So I, I hope, and it was interesting because, you know, immediately upon hearing the Van Pelt news, I look, obviously, Callahan was going to leave. Cleveland, his son's now the head coach in Nashville, which that in Tennessee, which that's now official. So, I, but I immediately jumped at the 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 assistant offensive line coach, and I'm like, well, they're not going to let him get out the building because he's learned from Callahan. So you can kiss that one goodbye. And then you, I was trying to again cross reference, and then very quickly, I think it was Mike Reese had the first report about about Dickerson being the target there. And then you're trying to, because like you said, you're trying to cross reference it and struggling to necessarily find the full connection there, but thinking, all right, well, if Alex and Waldron work together, have some conversation there, like, is that where it comes from? I don't know, it, but it's critical. I, I, as I said, something I'm working on, you're working on, like, I, I, I hope that that is the case, that he had a hand in that, because if he didn't, you didn't love the search for offensive coordinator, then maybe you're not going to love the search for his most important um, coaching hire on the offensive side, aside from the offensive coordinator. Do you want to collaborate as we work on this separately? <laughs> uh, I think you and I collaborating would is a little different than the, the, some of the nonsense that's getting pushed in all these different NFL organizations yeah. from collaboration. Of course. Uh, yeah, and to, to, to just to put a bow on the collaboration, I, I think it's more corporate, like BS, synergy, you know, things like that, <laughs> right. and actually yeah. kind of a, of a bad word. But I think what Gerard's doing, he also mentioned knocking down silos, is a very good thing. Like your people should talk with one another in the organization. And we talk about filling out the staff where running backs, fitting, uh, running, uh, excuse me, running backs coach. And if he's a voice coach, I'll take him. Um, Vinny Sanceri is still there. Receivers coach, Troy Brown, Adrian Clem, who I reported last month, is un not expected to come back. And we see the first news after Van Pelt's hiring is they're targeting an offensive line coach. Mm -hmm. So long, Adrian Clem. Uh, and best wishes is he recently came out of the hospital uh, after being there for two months. And Will Long, who I can't imagine is going to stay in New England. So there's a good chance this is an entirely new staff coming in under Van Pelt. And we, I don't think it does us any good to speculate. I think having a head start on an offensive line coach who's experienced and been in other systems um, is a positive. 
But it will bear watching because the other part, and we talk about salary with Kaylee possibly, in addition, maybe just not wanting to move and take the job. The power to hire your own staff is so critical for an offensive coach or a defensive coach because it's just like being a head coach, right? Am I going to win or lose on my own accord or am I going to win or lose because I got stuck with these Jamokes as we just went with with Bill O'Brien? Jamokes, not specific to the Patriots assistants, but you understand what I mean. You want to run your show the way you want to do things. And if you can't do that, that's an issue. And Alex Van Pelt did an interview with the Bucs and Raiders for their offensive coordinator job, but... I don't know. Let, let's bottom line this. Alex Van Pelt, Patriots offensive coordinator. Summary of your feelings or what? It leaves something to be desired. But I will say, again, the, the quarterback background is critical. And that, and that's the fact that he has had had good relationships with a lot of these guys. Uh, you can say Aaron Rodgers spoke up for him. Maybe that's a knock against him. <laughs> but in, in general, like he's had good relationships with these guys and he's been able to get, uh, you know, Baker Mayfield had his best year with him at quarterback in, in Cleveland under his eye, you know, like Brissett did a nice job stepping in. And as someone told me yesterday, I, I tweeted it out, like the fact that he was able to get five different quarterbacks ready this year. And I, I want to say other than Walker, Maybe they all at least had one win as a starting quarterback. Like, pretty freaking impressive, right? Like, that's it doesn't happen in the league. Like, we've had a lot of injuries in the league and you have different starting quarterbacks, but to have five different guys have to start a game for you and you make the playoffs, uh, and and the last guy is a guy who granted had a ton of experience, but you pull off the couch, you know, was thrown to his 60-year-old brother or whatever the heck it was, his dad, <laughs> whatever. You know, like, it, it's pretty impressive and says something about his ability to sort of streamline things and make it so that that could quickly be absorbed and then you could take it out on the field. And yes, Stefanski was calling it, but at least he was part of the build of that of that offense. And Stefanski had final say. That's the other part about this. And we try to project, what's the system going to be? Who's he going to hire? What does he want to run? Like, it's great. He can pull from McCarthy and Zach Taylor and by extension, McVay and Mike Shanahan and you know, obviously Stefanski. But Alex, uh, Alex Van Pelt was a sideline offensive coordinator who did not call plays. And they had a quarterbacks coach. So it's it's a strange setup that Stefanski really mm-hmm. dominated aside from when he got COVID twice in 2020, which is hard to project. I will give this bottom line, however, a C. And I think I, I, I was leaning C plus, but I look at it from this perspective. If the Patriots were going up against the Browns, as they did in 2021, and absolutely smoked them, defense dominated. But again, it's Stefanski. Let's not knock Alex Van Pelt uh, for that. What would Bill Belichick think of facing an Alex Van Pelt offense? They did it twice in 2009. Granted, a very long time ago, very different personnel, bad quarterbacks. I don't think he's particularly scared. And in a league where it's not just that the young coaches are new and there's something sexy about it and unknown and they're going to be on the cutting edge and yada, yada. It's just that I think he's a known commodity at this point at 53. It will be new, obviously, him taking on this role. And I... Hope he succeeds. I don't know about you. I am very in for some new sizzling offense here in New England because I'm starting to forget what it looks like. And the quarterback coach experience is invaluable for what they're going to have. But being the 12th candidate out of 12, interviewed, accepting so quickly, and a guy who has not called plays before at 53 um, gives me pause. And look, if he does fail, to whatever definition you want to have failure, it's not entirely going to be his fault because, again, look at the personnel. That's the biggest part of this. But as far as where they landed, and I'll, I lean closer to C plus and C minus for sure. But I'm going to give it a solid C. Yeah, I think it's I think it's fair. I think the other part, and you mentioned sort of the overlap with Elliot Wolf. You know, so I had someone telling me basically like Elliot was driving the bus on on Alex. That's how Alex entered the chat, if you will. Um, so. You know, I don't know where they called their list from. You know, how many people contributed to that? If Matt gave these names and Gerard said, I like playing against this guy, like he was difficult to do against. And then this, you know, from Elliot, but like the Elliot Alex relationship is clear. And I, I'm not certain that Alex gets involved if it's not for Elliot. So, you know, what, you know, it's obviously Alex did enough to come in there that Gerard said, like, no, 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 that's. We don't have to do anymore. That's the guy we should bring in now. But uh, to get there and for him to be, as you said, the 12th of 12 is, I don't know how you could be like, woohoo, they uh, they really nailed that. 
One other game I forgot I mentioned. They played in 2021. They played in Cleveland in 2022. And this was Jacoby Brissett. Renaissance. Patriots are on the road. Bailey Zappi's getting the start. Cleveland was favored. The Browns scored 15 points and had an interception, I think, on the first play. <laughs> it was Kyle Tucker yes. reading that. So when I asked I believe the question, somebody, I believe somebody from the Boston Herald wrote a nice, wrote a nice little, like, how did that happen play? The Kyle Duggar interception. Oh. Did you not? I believe you did. I remember that. Thank you very much, Michael. How about that? Um, yeah. I did. But anyway, yeah. 15 points, not a lot. So when you think about how, you know, Bill Belichick, who's scouring all of the backgrounds and all these coaches and plays they've run and trick plays and where they're going to come from, all the ideas in the room. And again, Stefanski ran that offense. He called the plays. He set the game plans. But Alex Van Pelt was his number two. 15 points. I think that says everything about how the Patriots and possibly Gerard Mayo at least at that time, felt about facing him. But he's in about, about that About that game, Andrew, real quick. Yeah, yeah. I thought that Stefanski called a terrible game that game. I had no idea what they were doing in that game. So, yeah, just my little quick thought on that game. Wasn't, wasn't great for any anybody involved with the offense. Thank you for adding that. That, that might be yeah. the clip that we promo this uh, podcast <laughs> with. Perfect. Uh, two, well, now I'm just going to deliver the point. <laughs> That pick that Kyle Duggar made, um, they were in the three tight ends. It was a play-action pass to the right sideline, and Brissett rolls out. They hadn't run that particular concept since last season. And so this was week five, I believe, in 2022. So at least the first play, I don't think it's his fault that they had was new that season and hadn't run before. It was just better tape study by, by Kyle Duggar. Uh, who was your seventh priority free agent for the Patriots, huh? Yes. He wow. was. Wow. You have him higher? Uh, yes. Now, I get the point about Jabril Peppers being in here, and Kyle Duggar might have hit a ceiling as a football player, but I also think he's probably no lower than the seventh best player in your team right now, and it's not a team that can let go of many of those guys in that top seven. Look, I, you know you know how I feel about the salary cap, so I, I don't want to like get too chewed up in numbers because I think that you could do pretty much whatever the hell you want um, generally over a three- or four-year period. But I would say that if my understanding of where they were in the spring from a contract standpoint was not close, and I would, and this is not often the case, but I would tend to side with the team about the value of the player, which is why I sort of drop him down into that 6-7 range because I thought like, A, I think he's maxed out as a coverage player. I think we've seen the same coverage guy for three years. I don't know that that aspect of his game is going to get any better. Um, I think he's a fine player above average, but I don't know that I'm sinking the kind of money into him that some of these other safeties have gotten when I have peppers who can do the stuff in the box that Kyle does. I drafted Marte Mapu, which whether he's a good player or not, we don't know, but I did draft him in the third round. And, uh, if I want to become a good football team again, I better be able to develop my guys, which has been a problem. So I better hope that I can develop Marte Mapu into a good player. I, I just, to me, there's a lot of overlap there. And I just don't know that that's a position that I'm going to sink a ton of money into when, as I said, I feel better about giving Jabril a two-year extension and then hoping that I can develop Mapu into being sort of a similar type player as, as Kyle was. You're wrong, but that's all fair. Um <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no. Wouldn't be the first. Wouldn't be the first time. Although recently I've been on a heater, so that's you know. Yeah. And by recently, I mean like the last two years. So that's a, well, recently yeah. Kyle Duggar also switched agents from that time when he was with I saw that. Athletes First. He is now with one of one agency, uh, led in part by Andy Sims, who formerly represented Devin McCourty, Jason McCourty, Tron Harmon, Jonathan Jones, and you might go, oh, those are four Patriots defensive backs, just like Kyle Duggar. They are also. Four Patriots defensive backs who, while represented by Andy Sims, resigned. And I told you months ago, if you were a, a loyal listener, that Kyle Duggar was was sniffing around, maybe changing agents. He finally pulled the trigger. And if there's one guy who plays his position or reps his position and can get a new deal done, I would think it would be Andy Sims. I'm not making any mm -hmm. predictions, but that to me says that what Kyle told the media, yeah, I'd like to be back in New England, which is what all the free agents say, by the way, I think actually holds some water. Look, I, as I said, I'm not opposed to it. I think he's the, like, I, I take him. I just, I think that the level of where he wanted to be or where his agents wanted him to be versus where I think he should slot are two different places. And 
if I'm talking about a three or four million dollar a year difference at that position, I'm good. You know, like I, I would prefer to have you on a second contract here, but I'm also not going to overextend myself for that kind of player at that position. That's fair. All right. I mentioned That's that all. was a uh, scuttlebutt. I'd heard about Kyle Duggar months ago. You have the scuttlebutt. I want all of the notes. I want all of the rumors. I want to set the <laughs> scene at the bar in the stadium, aside from you getting sunburned, players who look good, guys that you love, like just all the juicy stuff. Uh, so from scuttlebutt, like, look again, as it sort of ties into the Patriots offensive coordinator search, just a lot of people are like, man, it's just, just not a great job. They're devoid of talent on the offensive side of the ball. So yeah, you could tell me you were going to draft a, a quarterback at three, but then who's he throwing to and who's protecting his blind side. And the, you know, they're just, just not a lot of love. And this has really been the last two years of, of talking to people about the Patriots teams that have played the Patriots being like, we don't, there's no one you have to game plan against on that offense. So there's a long way to go to make that offense uh, acceptable again in the national football league and be something that someone fears. Um, you know, as someone, and I, you know, I, whatever, I'm a little guy. I can say it. like, they call your best receiver is a six is a six round Lilliputian is what I was <laughs> said, you know, talking about pop Douglas and, you know, like, yeah, I mean, after Kendrick Bourne went down, you had to lean on, on pop and pop was a nice spine. Right. I think we all liked what we saw from him after they drafted him. We talked about him ad nauseum. And while I made the comments about the receivers, he was not included in that group. We had spent the previous segment of that famous breakout clip of Stink, Stank, Stunk. Thank you. We about said how good I've pop- only been trying to get you to re it <laughs> for months in this podcast, and you refuse to do it. I'm glad that the statute of limitations it's, is over. Yes, it's over. Let's it's print over. the shirts. We should print the shirt. Actually, someone gave me a shirt, by the way. It's a fan. <laughs> who, a fan gave me the Stink, Stank, Stunk, because that's the Grinch. Right. So he gave the shirt to Phil Perry. Oh, because he was down. I think he was in the. I think he was in the Optum Club, and he gave it to Phil to give to me. <laughs> guy from guy from New Hampshire, a, a season ticket holder from New Hampshire. Yeah, he actually also had uh, Hershey's Kisses printed up and had the Stink Stank Stunk written on the bottom of them. Wow! So big fan. Yeah, um, but like we had talked about Pop in the previous segment, Felger and I, and I think Michael Holly about how good Pop had been through that point in August, and like I think Pop by and large, delivered on some of the promise that we saw. But again, six-round guy, 182 pounds, like he's got to get thicker. He's got to get stronger. You know, a couple concussions. Uh, he hurt a shoulder. He hurt a shoulder, I think, in preseason. What did he hurt against Green Bay? Remember, he the I think it was a shoulder. Like, so there's some things there durability-wise that you say to yourself, like, okay, if you're going to play that position in this league, you got to be able to take the punishment um, and, you know, it wasn't perfect on that front. So that that was one of the things I think a lot of people too like took um, took exception, I guess would be the word, to everything being placed at Bill's feet. You know, it mm-hmm. seems like, you know, like and I think we've kind of viewed this from from internally or from being here, like so you're basically just running it back. Like you're kind of just, you're going to keep the same personnel guys. You're going to keep some of the same pieces in place and pretend that they didn't have anything to do with where the organization and where the roster's gone the last couple of years. Yes. I know Bill had the, you know, final say and was the, the big decision maker and obviously, a, you know, huge presence and touched everything in that organization. But like a lot of people kind of were put off a little bit by the notion that it was just, oh, sure. It's just Bill who was only, you know, if not the greatest coach of all time, certainly one of them, uh, that it's all his fault and nobody else's. And I think a lot of people sort of just, eh, you know, like Bill has his fault, as we well know. Uh, but I think people around the league were like that. It seemed a little much in that regard. Uh, as for – oh, go ahead. No, no, no. Scuttle, scuttle away. Um, <clears throat> so I have a little thing coming up in my in my notes column that's going to run. I think it'll run start on Friday. Usually that's when we post them. Um, well, Justin Fields, because I think it's been a uh, it's been a question that's been asked by a lot of Patriots. I'm sure you get it. You know, people in your comments or um, you know on social media asking about Fields and hey, does it make sense to maybe go get Fields and what would the cost be? And so I asked around about Fields. Um, I don't think. Even though Chicago is still, Ryan Poles is still trying to uh, 
put the brakes on that we're full on in on a quarterback in the first round. I think that there is some pressure. The sense I got is there's some pressure in Chicago now because you passed last year and while you, the trade was great, right, in terms of the assets that you brought back for Bryce Young, who was not very good in, in Carolina this year. The fact of the matter is, is you missed on C.J. Stroud. And that was a question that he got a lot of. Ryan Poles did in his uh, final, you know, whatever, season wrap-up interview. Um, and he didn't want to go too deep into it. But I think that in talking to some people around Mobile, the sense is like, I don't know that he's going to be allowed to do that again. So that would obviously, I think, m make it more likely that Justin Fields becomes available. And, you know, if he becomes available, what's the cost? Does it make sense? You know, you don't have to pick up the fifth-year option. Um, I heard mostly the general thought was third-round pick. Some people trying to push maybe like a high second, but like, I mean, a, a low second, but whatever. I think you can make that work if that's something you wanted to do. But then I tried to learn more about the player because like, you know, I covered the league for a couple of years. And then this last year, I back in New England full time and I didn't see Justin Fields play a ton. We obviously saw him two years ago in the game in which maybe Mac Jones was officially broken in New England. Um, and Fields was pretty good that day. But if you just look at some of the, the numbers and it just... He's played a lot of games and he hasn't really matured very much as a passer. So I think generally when you're, I want to say it's 40 career starts now over three years, generally kind of are what you are at this point. Um, unless you're Josh Allen and you make that massive leap. And even Allen might've been less starts than that before he took his big jump. So uh, a little bit on him. Um, I'm trying to think of else, what else sort of stood out league wide. Oh, a lot of talk about Baltimore just blowing the opportunity and then now dealing with some serious defections, um, whether it be front office, coaching staff. You know, they, they obviously lose Mike McDonald, did a phenomenal job taking essentially the same defense that they had under Wink Martindale and making it jump into a top five defense the last two years. Uh, Denard Wilson, their DB's coach, is now the new D.C. in Tennessee. Um, Joe Hortiz jump to be the GM with the Chargers. There's some other pieces there too that I think are moving. And, you know, we've seen it up close and personal. Um, Baltimore has done a great job organizationally of always having these sort of pieces in place. But you start to lose too many of them and then you sort of wonder, you know, where does the organization go? And do you end up in a situation where, you know, like the Patriots did, where the brain drain eventually costs you? I was going to say, Player I can wise. think of a team that has just endured all of that. And there are a lot of fans listening going, oh, boo-hoo <clears throat> for Baltimore. You lost a coordinator yes. and another coach. And then, you know, yep. up through it, at least make a Super Bowl and then whine about it. Like, <laughs> it, it is a bummer for them. Yeah. But, like, come on now. Yeah, and they have Lamar, who's still going to – he's going to win the MVP, and he's, like, 27 and still awesome. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm just saying that in terms of the big picture thing, like that's a team that was the best team in the AFC, and you could argue maybe it was the best team in the league all year mm -hmm. until this past weekend. And, like, it, it, it'll look a little different. And I think they'll lose some pieces too because now they have two defensive guys who helped implement the new system that they have in place, and now both of those guys are going to be searching for the Patrick Queens and the Geno Stones of the world to help implement the system in Seattle and in Tennessee. So you might not be able to keep some of those guys that maybe you wanted to keep. From a player perspective, I thought it was pretty fascinating. I went down, and obviously, um, I went down with Greg Bedard. Greg likes the big boys, so he spent most of his time watching the offensive line, defensive line, and I was in charge of quarterbacks, running backs, wide receivers, and tight ends and corners, um, some safety stuff, and did get you know some eyes at various points on some of the big guys when some of the periods were slower. But quarterbacks did not jump out, my friend. Like if you're in the the draft Marvin Harrison, trade down, draft Joe Alt and get an extra pick, those sorts of things. Um, I got to tell you, if you were thinking this because of Bo Nix and Michael Penix, well, okay. I would scratch I would scratch Bo Nix off the list. I think Bo Nix is a really good athlete. And I'll give this a, a little preamble. So when they do this, like they don't get to work together with the receivers. So there is the process where they're working through trying to learn the receivers on the fly in practice with everybody, all these scouts and GMs and so forth and, and the media watching them. And it's not going to go perfect. It just doesn't. I think if you go back and look at 
senior bowls for years and years and years, you'll see some of the best guys have gone there and it takes a little while to get their footing. But by a little while, I mean like a day, maybe a day and a half. And then you've got to show that, okay, I'm, I'm comfortable now. You know, Nick's didn't do a lot of stuff from under center at Oregon. He struggled with that at the senior bowl in the three days. Um, he struggled with accuracy. He struggled with decision-making. Um, he had a stretch in team on day two. It was like a four-play stretch where I was like, oh, had A.J. Barner, the tight end from Michigan, on a skinny post, not a lot of pressure, threw the ball about six feet behind him to the left. Like, Barner had no chance, like kind of like fell down to try to like slide over and his, the ball was harmlessly over there, dropped the snap, like just – uh, just made some bad, bad reads, struggled in red zone work. I just, I'm not, that's not the full picture of him, but I think there was some talk that maybe if he had a great senior bowl that he could insert himself into the top 10 conversation, which I thought was nonsensical to begin with. And I think after those three days, to me, I'm not saying he can't get better, but he's a bit of an older quarterback. I, I, he feels like a spot starter to me, or it feels like maybe he's a starter on a team that's a bad team that's looking to replace their starting quarterback in a year or two, like, you know, down the road. I mean, we'll see again, not a big guy either. Six, six, one and change thicker than like he was standing next to Sam Hartman. Sam Hartman from Notre Dame is the skinny, like the lower half of Sam Hartman undrafted free agent, by the way, in my opinion, but like those sorts of things, I, I, I can't envision someone saying, Nix is the guy we got to have, and we're going to turn this over to him, and it's going to go great. Penix was the best quarterback on day one, and, you know, he's got the awkward delivery. I think people have seen it, If you even if you watch a little bit of college football this year. Is it year. awkward, or is it just lefty? It comes a little bit three quarters, okay. and he definitely doesn't always marry upper and lower half. But what's funny about that is it doesn't seem to bother him generally in terms of accuracy, and I thought on day one – like, and, and this, again, he and Nick's were on the same team. So they were literally throwing in competition with each other. And it was, a st I thought there was a stark difference there in terms of overall accuracy, uh, anticipation. Like he's, I thought Penix threw very well with, you know, anticipatory, especially to the sidelines. The arm is good. You know, I don't know if it's great, but it's good. Um, and he was more uneven in day two, better in day three, especially in the red area. But like, to me, of those two guys that I went there and looked at, and those are the guys that we're talking about, either some people with the first round buzz or at least certainly early second round. To me, Penix was here and Nix was here. And I don't think it was I don't think it was that close. Uh of the other guys, Spencer Rattler, he might have been the best quarterback there. And and look, like there's no question about his arm. Like he's he's not a big dude. He's six feet. And he's not even that, like, I thought he was thicker. And when I saw him in person, he's just not as thick as I thought he was. But he drives the ball really well, including outside the number stuff. He's accurate. Uh, but, like, that's a, I'm a heightist at the position. Like, you got to be a freak athlete to me. Like, I don't love Kyler Murray, but, like, I understand why Kyler Murray went one, right? I mean, he he has a ridiculous arm, you know, as strong as any anybody in the league. Also runs like a 4-4-40. Four, four, you know, great, great athlete. You know, as we, we know, baseball player, the whole thing. Like, you want to tell me you want to draft Kyler Murray at number one or you're going to turn the program over to Kyler Murray. I understand it because he's that kind of athlete. I Spencer's not that kind of athlete. So you're talking about a smaller guy, not nearly as athletic, not nearly as thick as, as Murray. Not that, again, not that Rattler's a first-round quarterback, but, like, he just – to me, he's a backup quarterback, and he has obviously some off-field things that he'll have to answer for. Nothing terrible, but nothing, you know, bounced around a little bit, and it's been seen as a little bit of a, you know, difficult personality to manage at times. But I thought he was probably the most impressive of the quarterbacks. Um, Michael Pratt was there from Tulane. He's had a pretty good year. I know that some people at the Senior Bowl – some people working for the senior bowl, Jim Nagy in particular, like he's a starter. He'll be a starter in this league for a long time. Mm, I didn't see it. Okay. Or, you know. I'll do respect to Michael Pratt and Jim Nagy, who's, who's been good to me. Um, we cannot yes. spend any time on this podcast about Michael okay, Pratt too late. So that's fair. we're gonna we're gonna close here. Um let's just pretend we ended on Spencer Rattler, shorter prospect, difficult personality to manage, because I think this is perfect to say goodbye to Mike Giardi, 
uh, at the end here because I, I have to go. I have an appointment that is not fair to you. But if you liked what you heard, here's the thing. And I've read his notes all week. You should be reading them at Boston Sports Journal. He has more Sunday notes coming, talking to more people around the league than you will hear from me or on this podcast, generally from our guests, because the guy's been around and the guy's very well respected. Read Mike at the Boston Sports Journal. It also just occurred to me, Mike, that I gave a final grade for the Patriots offensive coordinator hire. You did not. C plus. Oh, smart man. That's like the uh, what you call it. Uh, the Price is Right with I don't, Phantom. Just, yeah, I just I have to go a little it. bit higher than you, not to look like the nah, bad guy. I don't hate it, but I don't love it. Like, and we'll see. Like, look, the I I think having someone that that has the personality that he has will be helpful, not just for us, but I think in general in the room as they try to make some changes. But there's a lot of unknown there, even though he's been in the league for for a mighty long time. Yeah. All right, you're the best. Thank you, as always, for coming on. We will have lots more draft talk on this podcast. I'm sorry if people wanted to hear about Michael Pratt. We've gone over yeah, an cut, hour. No, well, you cut off. I had the receivers. I mean, we, like I got receiver stuff for days, so next, we'll have to do that another, another time. Next time. It's a deal. My man. Appreciate you. Have a good weekend. Hope everyone does the same. We'll be back uh, twice next week, once a week after. I'll remind you so no one needs to remember that. Uh, but appreciate everybody listening, and uh, be safe out there, all right?